Good evening, everyone. I'm Connie Butler, Chief Curator here at The Hammer, and it's my honor tonight to introduce you to two incredible writers, Hilton Alls and Jennifer Krasinski, who are here on the occasion of Joan Didion, What She Means. The show, as I'm sure you all know, is curated by Hilton Alls, and really I'm up here so that I can thank him for his generous spirit and his intellect and for bringing us this beautiful exhibition. This project has been an enormous success with a vast intergenerational audience that is loving the introduction to Joan Didion and sometimes the reintroduction to Joan Didion and the radical gesture of putting writing and images and dialogue together in the gallery. It has been pure pleasure living with this show in our galleries and I'm so grateful that Hilton has lent us his time, his spirit to bring an exhibition to life that truly has allowed us to think differently about what is in our galleries and how to engage an audience. It has really been a gift. <clears throat> now I'm gonna do proper introductions. Like the exhibition, the evening is one writer in dialogue with another. Hilton Alls is a Pulitzer Prize winning and, uh, writer and contributing writer at The New Yorker. He's received numerous awards, including the New York Association of Black Journalists first prize for magazine critique, review, and magazine arts and entertainment. He's a Guggenheim Fellow for creative writing, a George G. Nathan Award for dramatic criticism, and the American Academy's Berlin Prize. He's a professor at Columbia's University, Columbia University's writing program, and also now, uh, I'm happy to say, now a resident in California half the year where he's professor at Berkeley. His work has appeared in The Nation, The Believer, and New York Review of Books, and he also lives, of course, and is based in New York City. Jennifer Krasinski is a writer and critic. She frequently contributes to Four Columns and Art Forum, where she was, until recently, an editor. She's an erstwhile contributor to Book Forum and formerly an art columnist for The Village Voice. She's contributed essays to Riza Abdo, Jill Johnson, The Disintegration of a Critic, and Hilton Alls, Andy Warhol, The Series, and many more. She's the recipient of an Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant in 2012 and a Rauschenberg Residency in 2022-23. So please join me in welcoming Hilton and Jennifer this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Connie, thank you so much. I just wanted to say a quick thanks to Connie Butler, of course, to Claudia Bester, Belize Wilhelm, and Shannon Sonova also for making this possible, and to you, Hilton, well, for, you know, making all of this possible. But JK, you got on the plane and... Well, you did too. Okay. We're even. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here. It's Thank you. It's always an honor and a pleasure to talk to Hilton. And uh, well, let's begin at the beginning. Okay. Because uh, to get to Joan, we have to get through a few other projects first. Okay. I, um, I have had the rare pleasure, I think, in this room of seeing, I think, every exhibition you've curated. Yes. And people know you as an author, as a critic for The New Yorker, but not a lot of us know how you wound up curating it all. Can you give us a little bit of your background? Um, for some of you, um, you might remember that um, there was a gallery called Feature, and it was run by Hudson. Do you guys remember Hudson? And, um, oh, hey, Jared. And, um, <laughs> and he was really good looking. <laughs> and um, there was an article in The Voice about um, Hudson, and he was holding a little piece of art, 
and I was in the kitchen of my Valda, and I was sitting in the windowsill, and I said, I'm going to make him my boyfriend. <laughs> and she's like, really? And I said, yes. <laughs> and um, I'm going to write him a letter. Now, this is a long time ago when you could write a letter and, <laughs> and post it and wait for a reply. And I wrote him a letter, and I said, um, my mother has passed <coughs> recently, and I work with a friend of mine, Daryl Turner, mm -hmm. who was in your Reza show. Mm -hmm. And um, we want to do a show at your gallery. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I did do that. <laughs> and, um, and he responded. And we did a show called I Only Want You to Love Me. And the language of most, if not all of my exhibitions, um, is really a way to connect um, with the collaborators mm -hmm. and with the subject. And so the subject um, was my mother, but mostly really a lot about the women in my family. And I, same, similar thing, I invited a bunch of artists to contribute. And um, I had everyone go to photo booth. The, all the artists go to photo booth and take their portraits, and that was the sort of guiding principle of the piece that the artist was present. And turned out, I didn't know this until after Hudson died, it's very moving, but he was the only, I was the only person he ever let do work in his gallery. Oh, wow. And um, so you can't really forsake that kind of, um, that vote of confidence. Mm -hmm. And uh, so from there, there was a man named Simon Watson. Do you? I, to I remember Simon. Yes. I used to work for Simon oh. many years ago. That's another story. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what, there we go. And I wrote him a letter. And I said, um, we, we did a show. And can we do a show at your place? And he said, absolutely. I saw your show. And um, we did a show there called... Um, um, Love is colder than no. Um, it was a fastminder title that I can't remember just now, but it was um, my friend Daryl and I doing another show together, and then things unraveled mm -hmm. personally, and I. D this is a weird thing to say, Jennifer, but I didn't know how to advocate for myself. Mm -hmm. I could only advocate for me and another person. And so when it unraveled with Daryl, I didn't know how to advocate for myself as a curator. Right. Um, and m a number of years passed, and Peter Doig, the painter, you guys know Peter, um, asked me to do a show with him in um, Berlin. And I remember sending him many ideas that I'd stored up over the years. And the show was called... Um, self-consciousness, and it was a portrait show. Mm -hmm. And then I had always seen it in relationship to other people, um, that it was a, a way for me to connect. Mm -hmm. So that The Hammer, for instance, is a connection with Annie Feldman mm -hmm. for many years at the Drawing Center. And then it became a connection with Connie Butler. Then it became a connection with I.K., then Adam, and so, it, uh, so on. For me, it has to be kind of familial right. um, in order to talk. You know, it's, a, it's about communication. And so my friend Jared Buckheister, a wonderful artist, he'll come in. And then it makes me feel that the work is being done. Right. So in 2006... Ugh, 16, I was going to ask. Was it Jenny Jasky? Yeah, at the Artist Institute. Oh, the first is... time I ever saw a show curated yes. by you was at the Artist Institute. But it was a very particular kind of setup because it wasn't... Yes. It was three shows. In six weeks or something? Yeah, something like that, yeah. or three months? or Three months, wait, do I have yeah. A, March through August 2016, I did my research. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> but um, in that case, you were not only the curator, but you were also the subject of those yes. three shows. And I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about that, because for me, as audience for your shows, that was the seeds of what I'm seeing. Yes. What I'm seeing now. Yes. Um, wow, there's, there's something very powerful about um, 
um, psychoanalysis. Um, and there's something very powerful about your willingness to um, surrender to your own um, resistance and your own repression. Mm -hmm. And when Jenny Jasky asked me to do that show, those shows, um, all of a sudden there was this enormous energy mm. of visual information that I had been storing up for years. Um, and it was an opportunity for me to kind of cast off the repression that I felt because I'd always earned a living as a picture editor or it's kind of behind the scenes. And I was always in touch with visual information, but I would never put my name on it. And this was a way of putting my name on it. And you came to interview me, which was the first time that I'd ever been interviewed as a curator, and, oh. and which is how we became friends. But it was sort of these the, those shows in particular were an act of aggression against my own repression. And um, when they were done, I felt that I had a right to say that I could do this. Wow. I want to ask you. Uh, also to sort of frame what comes next is what is the overlap between curating and writing? Because I think there, mm. I actually think there's a lot Me and too. I know what I think, but I want to hear where those two things for you intersect. Well, um, there's, I think you have to kind of go to other interests. Um, so that for me, performing is a form of writing. People, actors are taking their bodies and, making language. Um, for me, curators are using, they're just really telling a story that when you walk into a gallery, um, one of the things that is so exciting about it almost always is that they are telling you something that you can glean. Now, I'm also um, very interested in an experience that I had when I was 15 and in those days, MoMA had docents. Mm -hmm. And I was you know, those, one of those nerd kids who would cut school to go to the museum or a library. <laughs> and I remember walking in to the MoMA, and there was a goat. And the goat had paint on it and a tire around its neck. And, wow. and I just stood there. I didn't know what it meant, um, but I was transfixed. And the, a very lovely woman came and said, um, I said, I don't understand it, but I want to. Oh. And she said, if you come back tomorrow, this is when they had docents, if you come back tomorrow at three, I'll talk to you about it. And there was a little tour. And I came back at three, and the tour was about how Rauschenberg had a goat when he was a kid, and that his father shot the goat, and that he had always looked for the stuffed version of the goat, and that it was about Florida and you know trash and all of that stuff. And it was like the top of my head blew off. Did it make sense to you as a child? Utterly. Like, yeah. Because she was giving language to something I couldn't articulate. And what curators do is that they're giving you visual language for the thing that you didn't know that you wanted to see. They're telling you a story that you didn't know existed in your own head. So that if you go to great museums like the Hammer or the Gardener, they don't really over-explain. They just kind of present, and that's what's um, that's what I prefer to do, is that the over explanation is going to happen in your own mind. You don't need me to tell you, but I can give you prompts um, to get there. So if we move on now yeah. to talk about um, Joan Didion, in my mind is part of a, a, a sort of triptych so uh -huh. far that you've done that included the show that's right now uh, up. And I just pulled a few slides. This was a show that um, you curated in 2019, God Made My Face, a collective portrait of James Baldwin. Yes. And it's. I'm just going to flip through slides so people can get a sense of this. And to me, one of them, I have... I walked into this show not really knowing what it was going to be like mm -hmm. because I had seen your Artists Institute show, which was multiple artists. It, it was thematic. It was personal. It was it was portraiture. It was self portraiture. Yes. But here you were taking on a, a titan of American letters. Yes. And you were going to talk about him in this way that I'd never quite seen before. Certainly not for a literary figure. Yes. 
can you talk a little bit about the gen this, this sort of genesis of this show? I can run through uh, images, maybe, so people can sort of listen and. Sure. Um, uh, you want like a voiceover? Well. Yeah. I mean, if you. If <laughs> I you, don't if, mind. If, okay. I don't mind. But also, or not, you don't have to. You don't have to. Oh narrate. no, no, I'm, I'm enjoying myself immensely. Oh, perfect. Me too. Um, um, so the, this experience happened because of um, David Swerner. And um, should I just go back a little bit to explain? I think so. Do we have time? Plenty. Okay. Um, so um, David rep started to represent Alice Neal. And I saw him at a party. I didn't know him at all. But I can be sort of crazy like this. And... <laughs> Um, and he was a very approachable person. And I said, David, you're, I understand you're representing Alice Neal. Yes, yes. Oh, nice to meet you, Hilton. And I said, but how come no one's ever done a show of her people of color? She lived in Harlem for most of her life and so many of her subjects. And when I was in, uh, when I was in um, studying art history, I would pour over this one book from the Whitney and see the kids that she had painted and so on. And he, uh, wh I went away, and then six years later, it was the phone rang, and it was David. And he said, do you remember that conversation we had um, a while ago? And I said, he said, I hope I'm not interrupting your writing, is what he said first. Wow. And I said, no, I hate writing. <laughs> and um, and he, Please interrupt. similar with um, Victoria Miro, it was these two gallerists who were moving the gallery model forward. And he said, come do the Alice Neal show. Didn't know if I could do it. He just let me do it. Um, and then he said, what's next? And I said, oh, well, I've always wanted to do a show about James Baldwin. Come and do the show. Now, did you always want to do a show about James Baldwin because you felt there was something missing in the yes. conversation around him? That one of the things that um, was happening with Baldwin that was um, distressing to me was that in, the, in his deification, they'd forgotten his body. And that another thing that was very um, upsetting to me was that they had forgotten that he was a queer body. So that a lot of that was erased. Um, the gay was erased. Um, the pain, the joy was erased. And he was just speaking. And people were quoting him. Um, but he was disembodied. So the whole impulse for me to do the show was to give him his body back and to use objects um, to create a self. So that there would be, for instance, on the left there mm -hmm. are, um, is a contact sheet. Um, he went to high school with Richard Avedon. And it was a contact sheet. Um, he sat with his mother. Um, and they're incredible, and I hope they're published one day, but they're incredible Avedon photos of him going to Baldwin's apartment where his parents lived. It was a railroad flat in Harlem. But this is a little bit later, and these are portraits of Baldwin with his mother. And then in the middle um, is another Avedon photograph, and they were going to do a book called Harlem Doorways together. And it's a doorway leading to Baldwin's apartment. And on the right is Alice Neal's um, portrait of a Harlem tenement. So I started to create a narrative um, and that once, oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, that it was a, a narrative that gave him a context in order to exist and to live again. And what is this on the floor then? Of that the is um, Cameron Rowland. And so the, 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 the um, first room in the exhibition was divided um, between Baldwin's past and um, queer life um, imagined by Marlene Dumas. It's, so it's called um, the famous forget the name of it just now, but it was um, famous men, and they were all gay or bisexual. Mm. And then when you moved into the second room, it was his, um, and then there was Glenn Ligon, and that was one of the, um, you know, Connie, what is it? The, <laughs> you know, it, it crumbles. Not the, char is it charcoal? No, no, no. It's some. He uses another element anyway. Um, thank you, though. It was um, he was using um, um, a piece um, by Baldwin, and it was called "Stranger in the Village," and 
um, that was the room where his queerness was coming out. And the record is Baldwin um, singing um, Amazing Grace. Thank you. And then this final, just to walk people through this this room. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, at the end of the show, um, towards the end of the show, um, wow, it's kind of like a dream to see it again. The There were projections um, by a, a wonderful artist, photographer had done a film called Shotgun, and it was two men of color giving each other a shotgun. Mm -hmm. And this was, again, giving Baldwin back his body. And to the left was a Deanne Arbus portrait um, called Young Negro Boy. And to the right of that was Anthony Barboza's photograph of Michael Jackson before he did start doing his work. And in the vitrine were scripts of Giovanni's room that um, Baldwin had tried to get produced during his lifetime. And that's a bust of Baldwin by his friend Larry Wallhandler. Um, it was done in Paris. And then you did a similar show uh, also at David's Warner. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just fast forward through these last few slides um, to get to Toni Morrison's Black Book. Mm -hmm. uh, two years? No, one year ago, sorry. Is it uh, just a year? Yeah, 2022. Eek, okay. I know. It went by so fast. I think it's because they the process is so long that you forget. Right. Um, well, because you'd been working on the Baldwin show for, I mean, how long before it, it went took up? about It was about two years. And then same with Toni Morrison? It was about two years. Well, and it's quick for, it's quick by museum standards, but not a gallery standard. Right. No, the gallery thinks, what, six six months? Um, you should have you it get, done? they give you as much time as you need, but it's only going to be up for six weeks. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so for Toni Morrison's Black Book, again, if you can... Tell us a little bit about the genesis of sure. this show and why you wanted her and the Black Book to come to life this way. Sure. Um, I think, well, Tony had been an um, editor at Random House. She did an incredible book called The Black Book. And it was, um, she did not use language. It was all told through images and some quotes. And it really had an enormous effect on me. And I told her um, that if there was one book that I could take, if the house was on fire, she, and she was, she liked it, but she wasn't amused that it wasn't one of her novels. But it was, <laughs> um, but she liked that it was a book she had edited, and um, and so in that, um, just in those memories, I started to think about how to make a, an exhibition that was the visual equivalent of her book. And then realizing, as I worked on it, that her entire program had been to make um, a universe of blackness. And so the, while the, some of the artists were white um, in the show, each was dealing with some aspect of her language or had been inspired by her language. So that, um, for instance, the, I, I dismantled the Victrola as an homage to her book Jazz because she wanted to do to contradict the idea of, she said, Josephine Baker and Harlem Renaissance and all of that, to dismantle it and to um, do a p piece about modernism. So the second part of the show, which is where you see Amy Silman's work, really was about Tony becoming a modernist in the modernist vein. And so there's Julie Moretto that way, and um, um, the dismantled Victrola. There was Amy Silman who used, um, who asked me which title of Tony should she make a piece about? And I said, oh, Paradise. So then a very clever young woman came up to me and said, well, there are more letters in that than, than in Paradise. I said, there's a period. So, <laughs> um, which is that last piece there. And that's Julie. And then there's, um, and she had just done the piece, um, um, Mercy. Um, and had read had read um, Tony's book, A Mercy. And the painting is called A Mercy. And there's a wonderful Martin Purier, and there is Chris Ophelia on the left. So these were modernist masters um, that were, to me, in conversation with Tony's bid to become a modernist. She had studied it uh, 
Quinnell. She had gotten what she called a shaky MA. Um, but what does that mean, a shaky MA? She kind of just wanted to get out of school. Right. Um, <laughs> but in the first um, part of the show, it really was about the emotional autobiographical elements um, so that Pecola Breed loves, we would have some shoes, we would have the wonderful Walter Price working in a kind of idiom that reminded us of childhood. And that becomes different in the second part, which you just showed with Julian, Chris, um, was her ambition starts to match um, the work that we see in, the, in that gallery. Oh, can I ask about the doll? Yes. I don't think I asked you. I remember seeing it in the show and thinking, what is yes. this? Yes. Um, the Bluest Eye. And it's a Shirley Temple doll that I found on eBay. And it was cr the face was crumbling. And it was very important for me to have the element of Tony moving away from, or criti actually, part of what makes The Bluest Eye so great is that it's a critique of beauty and Hollywood are standardized versions of beauty and Shirley Temple being a figure in the book. That was beautiful. And that is um, around the corner there. So there was a little wagon on the floor to connote um, Ava Peace sitting in the wagon in Sula. And then the little house back there, B Beverly Buchanan, really was this house of women. So we were moving away from the world of men that she um, wrote about in the early novels of Song of Solomon, and turning the corner to women's lives. And those were a row of women's shoes that I found from the period. And then it went into Sula, and then we left the room. There are the, sh there are the shoes yes. again. And it's a at wonderful um, Bay Area artist whose name I can't pronounce right now, but it's a beautiful portrait of a woman of color against the waterfall. And then the text. Um, there is the very famous ending of Sula where um, Nell says, I thought this whole time that I was missing mm -hmm. my husband, but it was you, mm. Sula. I didn't realize, Hilton, that the, I guess I'm thinking out loud and I don't really have a sharp question here, mm -hmm. but it's about these sort of multiple frequencies, right, around communication. You Writers, taking writers, yes. atomizing them in this way and and bringing objects into the conversation. Yes. I kept thinking about it as portraiture, but I think it's something perhaps more dynamic than that, and I don't... Oh. I'm going to pause oh, for a moment because we've come to Joan now. Okay. And I know that you wanted to read a little bit yes, of Joan's please. writing, sort of bring her into the I room. want her to be here with us. Wonderful. Yeah. Do you want me to hold that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, of Oh, I think it's really in the table of contents. That would help. Let's try. Yeah. Um, okay. So it's a piece that she wrote. Can you can you guys hear me? Um, this is a piece that she wrote in 1969, and um, it's about um, being a parent and being a mother, and also trying to be an artist. Um, I had wanted, it's called In Praise of um, Unhung Wreaths and Love, and it was in Life magazine. She had a contract there um, for a number of years. She, sh she did it, shared a column with her husband, John Gregory Dunn. They also did this at the Saturday Evening Post and subsequently at Esquire. I had wanted to make this Christmas a nice Christmas for my husband and for our baby and for everyone who came to our house in Los Angeles. And because such plans tend always to involve an element of self-congratulation, a way of perceiving oneself in a new and flattering light, I suppose most of all for myself. I saw a house full of candles and star jasmine. I saw myself in a long, paisley caftan. I imagined a season of improbably goodwill during which the baby and I would make a crash together, would do together so many small things as to imprint indelibly upon her memory some trace of the rituals of family love. We would make pomegranate jelly and wrap the jars in red cellophane. We would sit at the piano and pick out the jars 
and pick out the carols together. There would be no harsh words spoken in our house, no trouble mentioned. There would be, we would spend two weeks in some special focus, a Christmas, a Christmas portfolio by Irving Penn. Instead, I find myself in New York in a bleak hotel room over a nightclub. Musicians in dinner jackets take their break in the lobby. The night clerk asks my husband if we checked in with luggage and addresses me pointedly as Miss Didion. We share the elevator with Puerto Rican girls on call dates, men with failed eyes and worn Chesterfield coats, women with valiant 1942 makeup and genteel little hats and containers of cottage cheese for their dinner, an entire cast who somehow missed the call for whatever theatrical the rest of the country had been playing these past few years. It seems a peculiar time all over New York. Fathers and sons skate gravely around the Wallman rink as if acting out some dutiful misapprehension of what fathers and sons are supposed to do. The windows along Fifth Avenue appear full of the same gold and drifts of white, <clears throat> fake white snow that have been in Christmas windows for as long as I remember. I no more want a gold or white Christmas than I would go ice skating, but I begin to feel obscurely anxious about it, almost derelict. The season of doubt is upon us. I suppose that is some specter of failed love, some ch chasm between the idea and the reality that makes us wonder come Christmas if indeed we have been doing everything right. On the whole, I do not think much about other people's expectations of me, but I do at Christmas. I tell myself that I need only to see the baby and who is another city. I tell myself I need only to see my mother and father who are still in a different city. For an instant, I want to be, <clears throat> I want to be 10 again or 16 and start over. She was there um, working on a film and she concludes it by saying, I don't know how to um, give up the work that I love. So beautiful. <clears throat> Hilton, do you remember the first time you encountered Didion on the page? Yes. Um, I think it was in, I had a really wonderful English teacher um, when I was in junior high school named Jeffrey Wayne And um, he would, on weekends, I would go to his house and we would walk around and he gave me the denial of death <laughs> and the great Gatsby. And he said, also, I think you might like this woman. And it was a book of um, slouching towards Bethlehem. And so I must, that must have been 1973 or four. And he was one of those great gateways to reading. Um, and what I liked about the, the books, now this is a very interesting thing, Jennifer, psychologically, was that in my mind, she became mixed up with James Baldwin because How? of the singularity of the essay form and that you were able to speak in the I voice and then the I voice would not only permeate the world but become the world and they were able to describe the world and do it subjectively with no pretense that there was you know the objective stance and years later she's still in my mind with James Baldwin because her piece on the Central Park Five is just one of the most extraordinary acts of intelligence and also political um, power. Um, and so I was not surprised when they were auctioning off her things that she had left a list of her 10 favorite books and two of them were Notes of a Native Son by James Baldwin and Go Tell It on the Mountain <laughs> by James Baldwin. <laughs> So in my mind, they exist really as um, not only wonderful chroniclers of America and place, but about the ways in which gender and race work on America. And conceiving of this show, mm -hmm. what was, say, missing around the dialogue around Didion that you felt she deserved? No one was this? reading her later stuff. They, mm. It was so clear to me from the, um, bless these journalists, but, um, it was so clear to me that they had stopped reading. They weren't reading past Play It As It Lays, basically. And that they had not taken in the fact that she had become one of the more powerful um, political reporters of her time. And also 
a writer, a nonfiction writer who was not interested in maintaining the status quo of what she should have been. She was, should have been a nice lady from Sacramento um, and writing thank you notes and maybe having too much to drink on Saturday. But um, what she did was the world changed her. Um, those That period from 1964 to 1988 had a sort of catechismic effect on destabilizing who she was supposed to be. And she, a lot of us don't pay attention to that. A lot of us don't want to pay attention to being de destabilized by the events of the world, and she, she paid attention to it. And she courted it, too. I mean, she talks about that openly, yes. how she uh, she's always struggling against her own misapprehension, I think yes. is her, her word that she uses over and over again. Yes. Sort of struggle against my own misapprehension. Yes. And then misapprehension being, of course, the projection being the, the sort of cause of misapprehension. That's she right. She projects herself onto the world. She feels too much. That's right. And therefore, but, you know, unlike uh, Baldwin and Morrison, you actually had a chance to talk to Joan Didion. Well, Morrison, too, but um, oh, oh, um, I didn't before, know that about... before. Ah, okay. um, so, again, Sorry. it sort of grew out of a friendship. And as with Joan, um, the permission fr was from Tony to do the show. Yes. Yeah. And um, Joan, so what happened was that um, Annie Philbin and Connie Butler were very kind and had seen the shows in New York. And Connie, I mean, um, Annie wrote to me and said, I can't take a gallery show at the museum because it's, you know, commerce and, but um, if you ever have any thoughts. And I said, well, actually, I've been thinking about Joan quite a bit. She's fantastic. Can you come out and talk to us and tell us what you would have in mind? And I was so, it was sort of similar with Tony. I was afraid she would say no. Mm -hmm. And Joan wrote heartbreakingly beautiful email. She was very clear in mind, but she was suffering physically from Parkinson's. And the note said, it's emblazoned on my brain. She said, your show will be beautiful. Of course it will. Please do it. Love Joan. And that was it. That was the blessing. That was that was the permission. And from there, her family was great. Her John Gregory Dunn's family was great. They have been entirely supportive. How do you start conceiving? I mean, one of the questions I have is, you know you're going to do a show about Joan Didion. Mm -hmm. How do you choose the artists? How do you go about looking <laughs> at the world and saying, okay, yes, this and that, and sort of putting, collaging together, curating? I think it... Um, Again, I, I sort of dream for a long time before I work up the courage to propose. And in the dream of Joan, um, I always saw the wallpaper from the riot um, at Altamont. That was kind of one of the first images, key images? Yes, and also the black man in Central Park. And those were the two sort of big images that I had in mind to begin with. And then I also remembered from 1989, maybe, Jack Pearson's um, environment where he has two of her books. And so um, it was sort of a long dream. Oh, and also John, John Wayne was very um, much in my mind. I'll go back. I was trying to find Jack. I know he's in here somewhere. But That's okay. We'll start in the first room. Um, so the first room... It is really um, <laughs> Connie and Ike were so great because our zooms would be me saying I just you know Ike would pick up on the water and then Connie would say oh have you do you know Marion Hassenberg's work and I'd say yes but maybe we can have the water end with I need tumbleweed we can't just have water. And so there was a Martin Perrier piece that I loved um, that we didn't get permission for. This happened all the time, and then I would just go to an opening, and there was Alan Surratt's Tumbleweed. And turned out that Annie loved Alan Surratt's work, and the guys at Karma, Brendan, were fantastic. And so then we just started playing. Um, and one of the things that we played with was this image 
these walls that were dominated by a single image or so or a large image with a little image. And so John Wayne was super important. Um, how did I want it to run? I said, it has to be that it's almost sort of pornographic because her piece is almost pornographic. Okay. And so it was, it, was, it was really just that. It was a lot of Zooming because it was COVID. And then I would come and we would have more meetings and um, it was just a really great experience. I think one of the things... Also, there are oh. incredible um, reserves of stuff that is in Connie's head. She's she's the, the thing. She's the encyclopedia. Yeah, yeah, you should say, I, I'm thinking a lot about um, Wasser's photograph. She said, oh, I think we have two. And then Annie would say, oh, yeah, we have... So between these two extraordinary women, you're not going to really mess up. I think one of the one of the things that struck me um, was the now using Didion as this frame or this lens to then look at all of the works of these different artists, mm -hmm. and I found, um, I mean, one in particular, and and that's just one I could mention of many, Dion Arbus. Yes. Who who suddenly, if I'm thinking about, I never would have put Didion and Arbus together yes. in my own head, yes. and then suddenly being able to think about them together, and again, I could talk about a lot of other artworks that yes. changed things. Well, I think also that there was um, something very powerful in terms of their relationship to looking at the thing for what it was. Mm -hmm. And there's an extraordinary Deanne Arbus letter to her great friend Marvin Israel, and she's describing a scene in New York where someone collapses. And she said, would it have been better to look away? Mm. And now we know from mothers, sisters, lovers, that women are generally trained to look away, to assist, to turn away from the bad situation. When I started thinking about how Joan didn't turn away, Arbus was one of the obvious choices in terms of how she was documenting um, this ability to look at something straight on. And so that's why the, um, the the Tate, the Sharon Tate photographs were very important, um, and I'm very grateful to um, Jay Sebring's family for giving us permission to use them. I wanted the show to be equal parts metaphor and um, documentation, and the documentation you couldn't look away from, and then the um, the aesthetic objects would be those moments of reflection of pause and then you would be confronted with the real thing again. Right. I think what another thing that's come to mind is um, and I might be I this might be my projection mm -hmm. as a writer. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. We're all allowed. <laughs> You're placing literary figures. I'm just going to say for the sake of, you know, saying it at the center of a certain cultural production at least as a thought exercise uh -huh. in all of these exhibitions. Yes. And one of the things I like about that Many things I like about that. Coal dust. <laughs> Glenn Ligon, sorry. Oh, it's coal, it's coal dust. dust. Yes. We knew it would shake yes, loose. Yes, we yes. just didn't know when. Sorry, sorry. Coal <laughs> dust. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things I think that this is so uh, is interesting is you mm. are providing, these shows all are sort of giving us an alternative map of cultural production, by which I mean, oh. for writers who work in the art world, which is, such a gift, mm -hmm. but the duties can, there's a spectrum of duties, right? There's yes. a sort of ecrastic, ecstatic, sublime, when we're writing about artists and we're engaged. Yes. Uh, then there's something in between, lots of things in between. Um, at the far end, the language becomes, you know, the language of press release and so forth. Yes. And I think what I'm trying to tease Redu out is... Redu reduced in some way. Right, there's a reduction, mm -hmm. and suddenly being able to look at art and objects within the frame of American letters, uh, these three, again, giants in American letters, it is a remapping of how ideas travel, mm. of how a time period sort of comes alive through multiple, um, you know, multiple creators. Yes. I don't know if that's something you are conscious of. Is that something you think about? Is the, Because it does seem to be sort of... Um, Writing a certain lopsidedness. Yes. I guess. Oh wow. That's well, okay, that's that's a, that's a too mic much? drop. No, no. 
Um, thank you. It was that's beautiful. Um, I don't know how to respond to it um, entirely, but to say just to say that it has to be um, a, a combination of what you know is visually right to the text. So she was the guiding spirit. Um, you asked how how we went about it. We would sit in the meetings and I would read aloud while Connie Aww. would feel it and bring something to it and IK would bring something to it. And it was just a wonderfully intimate situation. I think also that I was, it, it just, all of those shows have to be guided by the words. And it was the, op it's the opposite generally. People walk in to these situations, putting up the visual information without actually having much language about it, or really bad wall text about it, or, sorry, and, um, <laughs> or something that's reductive right. in terms of not letting the art breathe for itself. So it seemed to me that if you had someone like Joan Didion who wrote so visually, it's not um, going to kill you to find the visual equivalent of what she's saying. Yeah. And so she's, main collaborator um, in this in this um, exhibition, the way that Tony was and the way that Baldwin's ghost was. I don't know how to describe it except to say there's the subconscious and then there's the, the, the there's your subconscious and there's the thing that you know is visually right for that moment. So it's the text, mm -hmm. it's your dreaming, mm -hmm. and it's visual acuity. I want to put some of your words into the room right now. Uh -oh. Well, it's from the essay, the, okay. your beautiful essay in the catalog. All right. And I know, I promise yeah. it'll be painless. Okay. At least, well. Okay. Um, so this is a quote from Hilton, his essay, uh, and he, his essay in this beautiful catalog that accompanies the show. Like Baldwin, Didion had an interest in how the dream politics serves as a reflection of what is unread or sick in the culture and what those dreams and sicknesses do to bodies, black and white. The trick as a writer is to avoid moralizing and to examine why it is that we need stories in order to live. Yes. And I felt like that was almost your curatorial mandate for this show. Oh, wow. Projection uh, on my it. part. I'll take okay. it. All right. I'll take it. Um, I think that one of, the th the, one of the gifts of this show, and of Joan in particular, is the articulation of... <clears throat> possibility mm -hmm. and she's always art articulating why something didn't happen and how it's possible that it might happen mm -hmm. and so she lived in this space between one foot was in the reality of something and then there was another foot in the dream of something and I think that I followed in those footsteps and the dream appears where the show in the becomes show? the dream oh in I the mean, last room say... in the last room okay. for sure um where um, we begin with water and we end with water. Anna Mendiata's um, beautiful piece and the imprint of the body being washed away. And it's Joan's spirit um, living in that room. And I am, whenever I give a tour, I break out in a terrible sweat in that room because it's really her. Um, and it's her saying, you have to listen to this work that I've been doing for the last 20 years of my life that not a lot of people read much of, but think about Cuba, think about how that reflects on America. Let's think about El Salvador, let's think about anti-Asian sentiment in Hawaii, let's think about all of these things. So people kind of leave her in Malibu in 1972, but if they read her in Malibu, it's hilarious. And she says, the thing I like about Malibu is when people can't get here when there are mudslides and rain and boulders <laughs> falling and stuff. So just, you know, I think people need to kind of read her much more carefully and thoroughly. One of the things that I, I wished for the show was that I'd had some time and space with your audio uh, interview with her. Yes. Can I, this is it's totally a personal question, but what were you talking about? It was busy. I mean, yeah, the good it's news, hard, it's the hard good news is the show was very busy and yes. everyone was really into and I didn't. We were talking about reading. Um, we were talking about books, and um, she was talking about the importance of Joseph Conrad to her, mm. and how she learned from movies to um, movie scripts to write scenes where people were speaking at cross purposes, mm -hmm. 
that movie scripts had taught her how to do many different kinds of dialogues, dialogue in multi-dialogue in novels. And then we talked about, um, she was very funny about reading, trying to read Herman Melville again with her daughter. And um, it was really a conversation about, um, she said, you know, one person whose sentences I just could never imitate was Henry James. I just gave up um, when I was at Berkeley. And I felt that everything had been done in terms of writing. So it took me getting away from California and from Berkeley t to New York to really begin again. Yeah. What about the, there, there are so many portraits. I mean, to, in my mind, Didion is, at least for her generation, probably one of the most recognizable American mm -hmm. intellects. And there are iconic photos of her. Mm -hmm. She's well aware that she's taking and so forth. And walking through the show, I guess, well, again, I'm going to, um, I'm going to tell a story that you tell in the catalog. Sure. About its early days, Joan Didion is working at Vogue. And she, this is in the essay on Maplethorpe, and she is remembering that when celebrities would come in to have their pictures taken, yes. or, or ladies or models or whatever, then they would say, you know, how do you want me to be? Yes. And the instruction was always given, like, uh, we only want you to be yourself. Yes. And Didion notes this, and this is a quote from her essay, uh, in fact, what occurred in these sittings, as in all portrait sittings, was a transaction of an entirely opposite kind. Success was understood to depend on the extent to which the subject conspired, tacitly, to not be herself, mm -hmm. but whoever and whatever the photographer wanted to see in the lens. That's right. And I had this in my head as I'm walking through and seeing And it's on the wall. Portraits, exactly. Yeah, yeah. These portraits of Diddy and you know the, anything from the sort of the beautiful the Don Bacardi. Yes. Um, I drawings. hope I'm saying his name yes, correctly. Yes. Those drawings I just found so lovely, and then there's the Jurgen Teller sort of bright and shiny Celine. Yes. You know fashion photos. Yes. There's something to say there about her knowing this, uh, about who she was. Yes. And. Um, there was that. Did I tell you this experience of? of a woman came up to me. Did I tell you this, Jennifer? I don't um, think so. She came up to me and she said that she had seen the show and that she was very moved. And this, one of the things that was particularly moving for her was that I had allowed a woman to age. Oh. That I had seen this person as a child mm -hmm. and then as a young woman and then as an adult and then in the last room with the Irving Penn um, portrait that you've seen, it's herself. And she's not reconstructed or... Um, oh, we might not have that. It's okay. Um, that it ended with her real face mm. um, was a profound thing for her as a woman. And I had not thought about it that way at all. I was just presenting this person. But for this woman to... For a woman to be allowed to age and to develop and to grow and to, then to disappear was was profound to her. I mean, it's a very profound thing to allow a woman to do publicly. Yes. She allowed it. That's right. I mean, I think... She didn't want you to look away. Right. She didn't want to look away. Right. Yeah. I know there's also something in there, a question I have, and I guess it also loops back to you, mm -hmm. about the idea of, you know... Didion wrestling outwardly, struggling with misapprehension and mm. with finding a voice on the page. I mean, she's also very, um, she's very generous in the way she talks about her copying of Hemingway mm -hmm. and her trying to find a voice. And so to find something that sticks on the page that is wholly her own, and then there's something about performing a self for the camera that is mm -hmm. also wholly her own. That's right. She doesn't smile a lot. No. Um, she wasn't <laughs> the kind of person who would really... Um, as her husband, John Gregory Dunn, said in his wonderful book, Monster, um, Joan is not the kind of person that you would refer to as the little woman. And, um, and I think that her radicalism as a person um, and as a thinker, and please do read the late stuff, has a lot to do with um, not giving an inch in terms of what she's supposed to do after a certain point. I really do think that return to California um, stripped any kind of, you know, gloves and handbag and pillbox hat ladiness from her, and that it was um, a way 
California was a way for her to become herself again, but from the distance, because it wasn't Sacramento, it was L.A. And she's in the beginning of where I'm from. She describes a conversation where her mother, where she says, my mother saw no good reason to return to Los Angeles after the 1932 Olympics. So um, it's a very, it's a funny country. Yeah. I have one last question for you before we open it up. Sure. Which is, I suppose, um, there was also the thought, there is the sort of hovering thought in, uh, in this show about how we also create our art objects in mm -hmm. order to live. Yes. You're welcome. I think it's a, I think it's a way for me to, I think it's a way for me to express myself by now that thank you for that. And um, the validation that I've received here from um, Connie and uh, Annie and IK and Adam and Linda, it's just been an incredible spiritual uplift for me and a, and a way for me to continue to kind of mess with things. I think that's my job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we're going to open it up for questions now. And I think there's an usher around to help with that. The person. I think there was someone right there. Um, thank you for everything tonight. Um, I really love the show, especially getting to see up close and personal some of her film reviews for Vogue. Yeah, isn't that great? And I they still, fired her. I, and, and that's like the tagline, right? Yeah. Like her first big job, and she purposely kind of fucks it up. Yes. And I kind of saw it as a way for her to unincorporate herself. Yes. Can you share more on your thoughts on Oh, the absolutely. Vogue? She was very um, clear. I think it's in the tape, actually, in the, in the last gallery, where she said um, the reason that they lived the way they did um, was very purposeful on her part, that if she had asked her father for the money, he would have given it to her, and she would never have known if she could do it on her own. And I think that ethos... Is, is part of what makes her work so resonant. Um, learning to do it on your own includes thinking and learning to see on your own. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for this amazing conversation. It's been very illuminating. And Thank you for coming. Deeply interesting. Uh, I was very interested in what you were saying, Hilton, about your, your process, and you alluded to certain practices that you have, your dreaming and your psychoanalysis. and Psycho. Psycho. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I, I wondered if you would share with us some of your practices. I thought you were going to ask me for my analyst name. Um, um, the, there's a wonderful curator in New York who said that she wanted to talk to me and understand my methodology, and I didn't know what she was talking about. But I think what I, what I start with, again, is always reading um, and this sort of arsenal of um, visual information um, that I just store. I don't know where I'm going to use it or if I'm going to use it, but I have a great memory for the things that I've loved connected to uh, a given subject. So it really is a, an act of, uh, it's almost sort of memorization, like an act of memorizing lines. And it's also um, having a visual memory for words. And I can remember in text where something is that really was very important to me. So um, it's really kind of a hodgepodge of memory and visual, mem um, emotional memory and visual memory. That's as fancy as it gets, really. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Why? I think we have time for one more. Oh, hello. 
That's that's Julie Moret too. Thanks for coming, Julie. Thank you. This is beautiful. Thank you so much. I just wanted to ask, like, part of the contradiction in Joan Didion coming from the family she comes from mm -hmm. and the world she comes from and the kind of privilege that she has in that mm -hmm. and can investigate and go where she goes because of that privilege. Mm -hmm. And you sense that through all of the writing, right? Mm -hmm. like, and um, and there's and, and it's complicated because the others that you're talking about don't come from that. Like the others that right. we just spoke of, like Baldwin or Morrison. But I'm interested in like the ability to kind of find, because I feel the same as you, this 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 intense and amazing radical resonance yes. in who she is. Yes. But it's in the face of that privilege. Right. And I think that especially right now, it feels like a lot of those types of subtle readings of being and capability and kind of who our allies get, get bottomed out differently. So I was just curious, like, where were the struggles for you also in Didion and in um, working with that work? I think that the um, it, it wasn't a struggle so much for me, Julie, with myself. It was with other people to um, open up their ears and minds to what she had been doing all along. So that the the common assumption was that this, you know, white lady who lived in Malibu and wrote from the movies, et cetera. That's the narrative, right? That she had come from Sacramento and she went to Berkeley. But if you, it wasn't a struggle for me really to watch an evolution happen. It always, it's almost always a struggle for me when someone is in stasis and then I have to find meaning in the stasis. Um, Tony made a lot more money than Joan Didion, right? After a certain point, 40, something years old, she was okay financially. And she had much more popular success than Joan. So I don't know how to weigh things like that. Um, we all come from somewhere, and it's really what we do with it that is to me the most important thing. And the fact that she did something with that um, and left it, she could have been, as I said, a very nice lady, from Sacramento, and then that didn't happen. So Tony could have been a very nice colored school teacher. That didn't happen. Baldwin could have faked it and been heteronormative guy, whatever. That didn't happen. So for me, it's always where they start, that I and then I leave it because of what happens in the life that they choose and in the life that they make. And had she... Um, that would be a very interesting conversation, Julie, one day about, actually, Tony is way more popular and richer. What does that mean in terms of race or what Joan gave to the world? So I'm interested in that conversation, but I didn't have to go anywhere because the evolution was so radical from who this person was supposed to be to how she ended up and how much she cared about us. We can't limit ourselves according to where we start. We can only define ourselves to where we end up. Say what, sweetie? Oh, just not even understanding that to be afraid. You know, that's the first movement is that you're moving forward and not knowing that you should be af afraid. So if you, one of the great things in, in Tony, the, uh, documentary about Tony, Timothy Greenfield Sanders, she says um, when she gets a job at Random House, she was 32, and she said, um, I just was more interesting than them, my boss. I was just, similarly, Joan, I remember being at a dinner, and there were these kind of like politics guys, me, her, and she just, she said, um, excuse me, but what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> and these guys were like, she was like 5'2 or something, right? And she would stop the conversation if it wasn't appropriate or appropriate to one's pro process of intellection, that if you were a thinker, you had to think better, think better, write better, be clearer, speak, read before you speak, 
um, all of the things that were taught in school. And so, in fact, I think, uh, I know that they were friends, Tony and Joan, at some level, but they had a lot of shared interests, which was, you know, the very uninteresting part of maleness. <laughs> you know, the patriarchy was telling them to shut up, and they were like, um, no, you shut the fuck up and listen. So that's why I love them. Thank you. <laughs>